Dots. What is it exactly? So Dots, or Data Oriented Technology Stack, is a new way of developing games in Unity. It is composed of three features that enable us to manage thousands of objects in the scene. Those features are the Entity Component System, the Job System and the Burst Compiler. The whole point of DOTS is the optimization by concentrating on the fast memory access. DOTS ditches the object-oriented programming and uses the so-called data-oriented programming. In this video we will mainly focus on the Entity Component System. If you want to see how to use the job system, there is a video for you, which you will find in the link below. For this video, I created a space shooter game that contains thousands of asteroids. So how does ECS go about optimizing games? Well, right now Unity uses object-oriented programming. It is a programming paradigm which does not concentrate on optimization, but rather on accessibility and ease of use. Let's take, for example, two different types of objects which we will use in our game. A ship and a rack. In the current state of coding in Unity, every object would consist of components that contain logic and data. A ship will have a component for receiving input, steering and receiving collisions. A rock will have a component for movement and also a component for receiving collisions. If we had two of each of those objects, every component would be allocated in a different part of memory. So. Every time a logic in a component refers to another component, we have to perform unoptimized memory access. The ECS solution is to isolate the component logic and put it into the system, which will iterate through entities with the required components put into an array. Also, all components are structs and not classes like monobehaviors, so all their data can be packed nicely in the memory. Let's test this and make a game with a bunch of objects. First, I downloaded the proper packages from the package manager. I had some problems with dependencies when downloading the latest packages, so to be sure, I used the Unity Physics package in version 0.3.2 and the Hybrid Renderer package in version 0.4.1. Next, I downloaded two packages from the package store, the Vast Outer Space and Free Spaceships packages. Then I started working on a script that would convert prefab game objects into entities and instantiate them. That script will be a mono behavior and will live in the scene hierarchy. To do that, we need to create a conversion settings object and use the convert game object hierarchy method to convert game objects to entities. That way, I created a collection of asteroid entities. Next, to instantiate an entity, a reference to an object called Entity Manager is necessary. It is used many times throughout the game. So for every planet in the scene, I created a ring of asteroids. The process for every rock looks like that. First, a random prefab is selected from the entity list. Then, a random position in a ring based on the planet position is selected. Next, the rock position has to be adjusted based on the planet's rotation. To assign the calculated position to component, I use the manager.setComponentData method. Next, in the similar way, I assigned a random rotation to all asteroids. And as we can see, we managed to make some pretty rings of asteroids. To make the rocks move, I created the first system called Rock Move System. I used the basic equation for calculating orbit speed. I also added a simple mono behavior that will contain fields for gravity constant and simulation scale, it will be a singleton. For the rack move system, additional information is needed, the center of the planet, the mass of the planet, and the up vector of the planet. That additional data will be stored in a custom component called rock data. The generate authority component lets us add components to game objects in the project. Also remember that the components in the ECS system are structs and inherit the iComponentData interface. In the system, I calculated the target position based on the orbit speed and planet rotation. I also rotate rocks in their local Y rotation to add a little spin. This system uses a method called entities.withName.foreach which schedules a job that iterates through entities with components passed in the parameters. Back in Entity Spawner, I set the entity rock data, similar to translation and rotation. In the Unity, I added the rock data components to asteroid prefabs. 
and fill the entity spawner inspector fields and with that we manage to create rotating rigs of asteroids. Next up the player ship. I started with component data that will be needed to steer the ship and added a system that will handle player input and move the ship. First, before scheduling a job, I assign the player input to variables for keyboard keys and a mouse position from the center of the screen. Based on those values, I applied the rotation and throttle to the ship, and at the end I added those values back to components. For the ship game object, I used one of the prefabs from the free package that we downloaded earlier. To make the camera follow an entity, I had to add a little hack. I created an object called Entity Tracker that would always have the exact position and rotation as the entity that it tracks. Next, this tracker, which is a game object, will be referred to in a camera follow script. To set the proper entity in the tracker, I needed to find the player entity and the entity spawner script using an entity query. From that query, I retrieved the player entity and assigned it to the tracker game object. I also added a simple script on camera game object that would change the field of view value based on the ship's throttle. In the entity spawner, I assigned player entity to the field of view controller tracked entity, exactly the same as in the entity tracker. Then I set up the player ship in the inspector. I was able to convert the already existing game object in the scene to entity by adding the convert to entity component to it. Now I was able to fly around with the ship. Next it was time for physics. To try out DOTS physics I created a simple projectile move system that moves entities with projectile data components in their forward direction. I created a simple bullet prefab and added the projectile data component to it. To make it a physics object I had to add a physics body component which is an equivalent to rigid body, and a physics shape component, which is an equivalent to the collider component. I did the same for the rock prefabs. Next, I created a system to shoot bullets in a given time interval when the left mouse button is pressed. Because I instantiated the object inside a loop, I had to use the without burst that with structural changes method. The reference to a bullet entity and a fire rate are held by player ship data. I assigned the bullet entity reference in the entity spawner in the same place where we assigned the player entity to the tracker. I also wanted to destroy bullets after some time, so I added another component called lifetime data and a system that counts the time left in the lifetime data component and destroys an entity when the time falls below zero. Because the without burst that with structural changes method is used, I can get a reference to the entity and pass it to the entity manager to destroy. I added this component to the bullet prefab and was able to shoot bullets. To detect collisions, another system was necessary. The collision system cannot use the entity that for each method, so I had to schedule a job manually. Collisions jobs have to inherit the iCollisionEventJob interface. In the execute method, I had to find out which entity was a bullet and which was a rock. Based on that information, I set a new boolean value in the rock data struct that would control if a rock was taken into account in the rock move system. So when a rock is shot, it will stop moving. Next, I created some rockets that spawn explosions. I made them triggers this time, so first I created a rocket data and a shoot rocket system. The only difference between the rocket shoot system and the bullet shoot system is that the rocket is spawned once every time we press the right mouse button. Trigger collisions are basically the same, with the only difference that the job inherits the iTriggerEventsJob interface. For the collision between rock and rocket, I set the spawn explosion flag to true in the rocket data struct. Now the system that spawns explosions checks if any spawn explosion flag on a rock data is set to true and if so instantiates the explosion volume entity. At the end it destroys the rock entity. The explosion volume entity is just a trigger collider with quite big radius. The explosion volume data won't have any fields. 
It will act as sort of a tag for the system. The explosion trigger system will be similar to the rocket trigger system, but here I get a rock component from the collision and set the explode value to true and set the explosion position variable to the position of the explosion volume entity. To make the rocks move away from the explosion sensor, I added a move rock on explosion system. Here I check if a rock should explode and if so I'll calculate the direction from the explosion to the rock and add a velocity to the rock in that direction. Pretty simple. In that way I had rocket explosions that can devastate ring planets. Raycasting. I wanted to add some lasers to the game, so I added the laser data that hold the parameters for the laser and a reference to the entity that is a visual representation of the laser. The laser data is a component on the player object. Raycasting jobs, similar to physics collision jobs, have to be scheduled manually. So first I schedule a raycast hit job. When the job is finished, I iterate through the raycast hit array and set the explosion data just like I did in the explosion volume system. As a result, the laser will push rocks away. After that, I instantiate the laser entity for visual feedback. The raycast job uses the cast ray method from the physics world class. The cast ray method takes the raycast input struct as the first parameter. This method has two overloaded versions. The first one passes a native array as a ref parameter and allocates all objects hit in the raycast distance. The second one passes a raycast hit as an out parameter and assigns the first hit object to it. This way the laser was ready for testing. Lastly, I added a guided laser that would hit the closest object and simply destroy it. To do that, I used the distance hit job instead of the raycast hit job, and instead of pushing hit objects, I simply destroy them. This job uses the calculate distance method. The parameters are the same as in the cast ray method, but this method does not need a direction. It will find the closest object in the given radius. To make the scene more alive, I added some post-processing and then played the game for some time. There is a lot of room for improvement and additional features like enemy ships, but let's leave that for now in this video. And that's it guys. You can find the whole project on the GitHub in the description below. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something from this video. Please like and subscribe if you like my content. There are new videos every other Monday. Also leave a comment, I'm happy to answer all of your questions. Take care.